Well, good morning and welcome to our Cosmic Conversations for this Friday. Uh, my name is Ryan White. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences. And today we're going to be talking about Big Astronomy, a program that's going to premiere, uh, would have premiered in the Morrison Planetarium, but instead it will be preparing on September 26th of this month uh, as a 360 streaming program. Uh, and along with me, I have Josh Roberts, uh, Supervisor of Planetarium Program. Hi, and, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Chile, and then we're going to uh, bring on a few of the people who are involved with making the Planetarium Show, Big Astronomy. And we're broadcasting not just on our own Morrison Planetarium Facebook page, but also uh, to some of our Big Astronomy colleagues' channels as well. Uh, so I think to get things started, um, the story of astronomy in Chile is a really important one. And Josh, I was hoping you could introduce some of the reasons why Chile is such a critical place for astronomy uh, today. Absolutely. So we are seeing one of the, I think, literally and figuratively defining features of Chile as we're looking down upon them. These are the Andes Mountains, and they form kind of the spine of South America, an absolutely amazing geographical feature. You can find out a little bit more about them inside our big astronomy show, but we are looking at them from the surface of planet Earth using open space software. Now, and actually, one of the something that's important for those of us who are in Chile is that those Andes are being pushed up by a subduction zone, which is a tectonically active place, uh, which we discovered firsthand when we were down <laughs> to, uh, making the show. But we'll talk more about that later. One other really amazing and important part is the part of the sky you can see and therefore the part of planet Earth that is occupied by South America. So here we can see California and tragically not much of California at this altitude because of the smoke. But by taking away the clouds of planet Earth, you can see a lot of the sky right up here is the Northern Hemisphere sky we are all familiar with for those of us who spend time in the Northern Hemisphere and who spend a lot of time looking up. But from down here in the Southern Hemisphere, since Earth is a globe, contrary to what that one friend of yours thinks, we can actually see a completely different part of the sky. And there are features in the night sky that are just invisible to us from our position in San Francisco. Namely, a lot of stuff in the far Southern sky. So down here, you get a chance to see, especially I think it's cool, are these two blobs, these cloudy features or nebula. They're not actually nebula as we know them, even though they were first called that. These are dwarf galaxies orbiting our own Milky Way. That's the lesser and greater Magellanic clouds. Actually, another thing I think it's worth pointing out is that is that you really get an amazing view of the uh, Milky Way uh, from the southern hemisphere. You're looking at kind of like the more exciting part of the Milky Way <laughs> um, uh, from that side of our planet. Um, and it's so striking that indigenous people in Chile actually describe patterns not so much in the stars, but in the dark parts of the Milky Way, which is kind of an amazing sort of cultural phenomenon. I will say as a Californian and city kid for most of my life, going outside and seeing the Milky Way from Chile, it was jaw dropping and absolutely exhilarating to see it that bright in the sky. You can also see cool features like our Southern Cross right there, one of the defining Southern constellations. But turns out Chile is not just awesome for its astronomical perspective looking up, also, looking back down towards planet Earth, we can see some really cool stuff as well. So I'm going to jump over to a visualization made by Null School that gives us a perspective on the weather that's happening down there. Now, looking around here, I want to show you right now, we are checking out the air at the surface and its speed. And you can see there's a lot of air currents moving around, but not much moving over these mountains. If we go a little higher up, you can see practically none air is really still on the Andes, especially right around specific regions. Uh, and that is a great place to build an observatory. I was gonna hand it over to Ryan. Why is still air such a really big deal? Well, when we observe the sky from Earth, we have the challenge of observing through Earth's atmosphere. And so the closer you are to sea level, the more atmosphere you're looking through. So that's one reason why observatories are built on mountaintops, but the, uh, the turbulence in the air is also what causes, from the, when you look at the night sky, it causes stars to twinkle. But for astronomers, that's not so much romantic, it's more problematic. When you look at uh, a, a turbulent sky, um, with uh, that you're, you're basically kind of messing up the, the clarity of the image um, 
uh, as you uh, as you observe something for a long period of time. So this still air is just a, a really important factor uh, for uh, for making really high quality astronomical observations. It's kind of an amazing little oasis right there where we have a lot of these great observatories where the air is just completely still. But Chile is an amazing place for a number of reasons. The weather, the mountains, the, all these factors line up as well as its view of the night sky. It's a really special place and one that I was excited to be a part of this chance to go visit. Wait, so you went down to Chile, uh, when was that? That was 2016 if memory serves, but all time is blurring together at this point. Right. And uh, I think, yeah, what's, what is amazing about Chile is that, you know, something like, um, I think we're looking at 70% of astronomical observations made from Earth are, of research uh, observations are made from Chile. It's absolutely uh, startling. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's just, it's the, it's the place for astronomy on Earth, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to, to tell this story uh, of observatories in Chile. I think what really struck me, and uh, you may have had the same experience, is visiting these places, you you know, the romantic view of uh, astronomy is that you kind of, you know, it's the lone astronomer peering through an eyepiece of a telescope. But in fact, these are, I think of it as like industrial astronomy. These, these places are huge. Uh, not even just the observatories that were built in the, in the, uh, in the 60s and the, or 70s, in the one case, uh, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory that we visit, uh, and then the Gemini Observatory, which is kind of leaner and meaner, but still a, a gargantuan, uh, built in, and starting operating in the 90s and, and 2000s. And then ALMA, which is the, uh, the just this, uh, it just defies description. It's such a, it's a, such a huge endeavor. Not only because of the scale of it, but also the location. When we got outside of a little white, Van, it feels like you're on Mars with the low pressure, with the barren landscape. It was beautiful, but man, was it hard to breathe. <laughs> so the uh, so the story of big astronomy is really about the observatories and about the astronomy story, and we'll talk a little bit about both those things. But it's really at its core, uh, it's about people, and because this is like industrial astronomy, it takes a lot of people to make this happen. And it's not just astronomers, it's engineers, mechanics, it's a whole range of people. Um, and so we actually went down to Chile, we interviewed people uh, to uh, to find out more about their stories, probably some of the same people that you met on your trip, um, uh, Josh, and um, and then tried to knit together and weave together a story. So I think with that, we'll um, thank you, Josh, for a little bit of My an pleasure. introduction to uh, why astronomy in Chile is such a great, uh, great thing. And, and now we're going to actually put a short video clip uh, featuring two of the artists who helped make the Big Astronomy Show come together, uh, Ken Ackerman and Mike Schmidt. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Ken Ackerman, and I'm here with uh, Mike Schmidt. We work in the visualization studio at the California Academy of Sciences, and we're going to talk to you today about a recent production we did called Big Astronomy and some of the camera techniques we used on that show. So Big Astronomy is a NSF funded full dome show that focuses on the people, places and discoveries that are happening at the big observatories in Chile. And it's actually gonna be distributed for free to planetariums all over the world. We had a wonderful time working on this show. It was a new experience for us. Um, and we're very happy to share this, all this information we discovered with you and we hope you can learn from it and then share your ideas with us. Ideally, we were looking for a one camera solution, one camera, one lens solution, so we didn't have to deal with stitching and something that could give us the resolution we wanted and the dynamic range of the footage. Something that would be simple, easy to use, and would give us instant feedback to what we were shooting, whereas in the past, using six cameras, you don't get instant feedback usually. We also needed to figure out which fisheye lens to use as well. The Sony Venice, which is this is ultimately what we decided to take down to Chile. You know, we have a, a camera rental house in town called Video Facts, and they were they were amazing at helping us work through all these problems. And we would go over there and test out equipment, and they were the ones that steered us towards this camera. And we ended up putting a Canon eight millimeter fisheye lens on there. But I think what in the end what it came down to, like Ken said, is the the dynamic range of the image was very important. The ability to change exposure and also use 
neutral density filters because we're going to shoot in a bright environment. So that was uh, sort of what led to the decision of us using the Sony Venice. The Sony just seems sharper in general. And, um, and just the controls on the, on the red uh, weren't as intuitive. And um, it just, it took longer to, to boot up. Um, and it was just harder to use. Yeah, I think it made us more nervous that it, something was going to go wrong yeah. when we were yeah. in the field. Especially since we're amateur cinematographers, we don't normally do this type of thing. So we wanted the simplest setup as possible. This camera was just, it was so easy to use and it gave us really, really nice uh, results. The other interesting thing was for all these shots, we had to tilt it up uh, 60 degrees. And so getting the adapters was always, you'll see in some of the, the footage coming up, just how kind of funny it was. Uh, it always felt like a little precariously uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. attached there, but, but it, it was safe. Luckily our planetarium has a 30 degree tilt. So we only had to tilt at 60 degrees instead of 90. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's a little bit of a technical introduction to some of the uh, the camera technology that was used in big astronomy. Again, we really wanted to capture um, the people working at these observatories. So we really wanted to, to use a camera to, to take people into, take observers, viewers into these amazing places. And so it's it just wouldn't be fair to, to only uh, share pre-recorded uh, Mike and Ken with you. So uh, we're live. Mike and Ken are also joining us uh, for the broadcast and uh, we'll share a little bit more going beyond the technology, uh, a little bit more about just what it was like to travel down to Chile, some of the kind of challenges that we met along the way. So, Mike, you were going to give sure. us a tour with this kind of cool, actually publicly accessible um, uh, site that describes some of our work. Yeah. First, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. I love how uh, <laughs> when we're watching that video, uh, I mentioned that we're an amateur uh, photographers and Ken bumps into me or I bump into him while we're filming. <laughs> that sort of describes it, how we were <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the beginning of this production. Um, you can see right here in this, this is a really cool uh, uh, app that we use called Polar Steps that allows us to log everything that happened while we were working on the show. And uh, at the beginning, we really didn't know exactly, we didn't know what camera technology we were going to use. So we did a lot of testing at the Academy. And this image right here shows you Ken um, on a scissor lift with um, Ian, one of our exhibit designers, testing a way to move the camera through space at the Academy. So we could sort of prepare ourselves for what we might be able to do when we're down there because Ken, who had already been down there, uh, once for a scout saw that they had scissor lifts in the telescopes that we might be able to use. So this is a, a really cool um, travel log of some of the things we did. And we can share this uh, uh, website with you if you're interested in diving in further and seeing what we did. But you can also see here that we um, spent a lot of time working with time-lapse um, uh, equipment as well. This is a uh, Matt Blackwell working with a so Sony a7R3 camera and Ken here uh, also learning how to use it on a motion control system. So that was one of the examples of uh, another type of equipment we used in addition to the video cameras. Because basically the video cameras were about taking us real time into these amazing observatories and out into the to the deserts of Chile, whereas the um, you, we can't capture the night sky with that technology. So uh, the time lapse allowed us to uh, to kind of show some of the telescopes in action because um, they do not, they, you know, they move relatively slowly. But also, very importantly, as you know, Josh and I were discussing, the the night sky in Chile is absolutely mind blowing. So we wanted to be able to capture that with with time lapse as well. Yeah. This uh, also shows that we captured sound in surround as well. So this is called a, um, this is a mixer. And then this is Chris Hedge, our sound designer. And he showed us how to use this. Um, sorry, wrong computer. Uh, he showed us how to use something called a holophone. Uh, let's see if I have a picture. Here it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Uh, Ken, do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, sure. So the holophone is good for capturing the sounds of an environment. And because the whole point of uh, full dome experience is that you're, you're put into these different environments, 
we wanted to be able to capture the video of the environment, but also the spatialized audio so that you could, you could hear things as though they are around you and, and really just immerse you in, in the space. So that's what the, this, this interesting microphone has, what does it have, seven, seven microphones on it, each uh, directionally spaced so that it can really, you can recreate the whole sound environment. Yeah, I think that's what it was. And all of those inputs are coming into this mixer here and that's where all the um, data is recorded. Pretty fascinating. Yeah, like you can see here. Record on little cards rather than having to take like tape decks like probably people once have to do that. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, the route that we took. We flew down to Chile twice um, for about three weeks each time um, to shoot at the observatories down there. And you can see the route is going through Houston all the way down to Chile. Um, let's see if I can click on this tab here. This is us on our first trip. Um, and this again is Ken on a scissor lift in the Blanco telescope at Cerro Tololo, which is if I zoom out here, you'll see it's about five hours north of Santiago. And this is the, the route that we drove to get there. This is a town called La Serena, which is on the coast. And that's where they actually control some of the, remotely control some of the telescopes. But this is Santiago right here. I don't um, have any issues with heights, do you, Ken? I'm sorry, say that again? You don't have any issues with heights, do you? Because you're pretty high up. No, there. no, thankfully I don't. Yeah, the, so the kind of the, maybe just a quick explanation of the point of this was that, you know, when you're shooting full dome, you kind of have a fixed focal length. And so we wanted to, um, we, we make a lot of our shows in, using computer graphics, fully computer graphic environments. And when we do that, we can do with the camera whatever we want. We can fly it um, high. We can bring it down low. We can make all these really fun camera moves. But when you bring it into the real world, it's a bit more difficult to, uh, to get the kind of interesting camera moves that you want while also keeping them very smooth for the dome because anything too handheld or jarring can really make people sick on the dome. So we were trying out a lot of different techniques. And we also had um, kind of a limited budget, so we couldn't get some really crazy cranes and things like that, which is why we we tried using things like the scissor lift, um, things that they had on site that could give us a lot of vertical displacement that would, that would make you feel the whole room moving. And we ended up using one of those shots in the show, so it, it paid off. Well, maybe that's a good uh, cue for the second uh, part of the video that describes some of the ways, the different techniques that we used uh, to uh, move the camera and keep that sense of motion and immersion in the planetarium. One of the, the things that was really important to us on this show was to figure out how to get nice camera movement, um, partly because we're so used to doing these CG shots where we have these really uh, long, fun camera rides. And we didn't want to go from that just to kind of static tripod shots. So we started uh, testing stuff out like crazy. And it was a, for me, it was a big learning process because I, there's lots of things you can do that do not work on the dome. And there's sort of a handful of things that you can do that do work on the dome. We ultimately kind of stuck with three basic camera moves and, and three um, camera uh, tools that we used to do those moves. One of them is called the Dana Dolly which is just a really, really simple, really easy slider that we, we found that we could only get kind of uh, horizontal left to right moves with it because we, if we tried to do forward and back, the, the track was always in the shot because of the fisheye lens. So that one could, could give us these nice left to right moves. And then we, we tested with a, a jib and uh, the jib would give us these really nice rising up moves. Um, and again, with that one, we, we tried to do kind of complicated, interesting stuff where we'd be turning the camera while it was moving. And it was just very hard to get something that was continuous and smooth enough to be, to give us like the gracefulness that we needed for the dome. So we tended to just keep it very simple and try to get something that felt very cinematic. And with both of those moves, especially, we found that you really just got to kind of choose your scene well so that you have a nice depth to the scene. You have something in the foreground, something in the midground, and then something in the distance. And once you do that, you get this really nice parallax that just looks great. At some point after our second, tr first trip to Chile, the Sony Venice released this extension called the Rialto, which allows you to essentially 
remove the, the camera uh, sensor and lens from the body of the camera. And then it's, connect, it's tethered to it with a, uh, a wire, but it allows you to do all sorts of different stuff that we couldn't do prior with the big heavy camera body. And we could then put that onto uh, like three axis stabilizers. We used a Ronin, for example. And it was something that we, we had tested with the full camera prior, and, but because of the weight and the, and the tilt that we had to do, it was very unsteady and it was very, it just made us really nervous about being in the field and trying to get this. But once the Rialto came out, it suddenly opened up all sorts of possibilities for the next trip. We also brainstormed ways that we could move the camera in even bigger ways. And you know, working with a, a finite budget, we couldn't rent huge cranes or, or attach it to a car or things like that. So we asked them if we could set the camera up on the scissor lift and get a, a, you know, a shot just rising up, looking at the telescope. And uh, we did that. The other one was at uh, Gemini South, we, we actually were able to put the camera up on the telescope and have them turn the telescope for us as they were opening up the, the vents to look out at the sunset. And, it, and so we got a couple of really beautiful shots with a lot of movement just by figuring out ways that we could utilize the environment there. I think that just shows that having good equipment with you that you can rely on allows you to be spontaneous and sort of take advantage of some of the the things that are there that you otherwise didn't anticipate. Yeah, so having a camera that we could just turn on and like get going yeah. immediately was awesome. And that's, yeah. the Venice ended up doing that for us. I'm sure that uh, by the time you watch this, camera technology has already changed. So we're really <laughs> eager to hear <laughs> from everybody about what, what you're using. But we just wanted to share a bit about that. Um, if you have a chance, check out Big Astronomy. Like we said, it's going to be distributed for free. Oh, and one last thing, Big Astronomy is in English and Spanish. So, um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Cool. I think that was way over seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
So we want, there's a few shots that we wanted to get and, and we just got these beautiful shots and we, we kind of wrapped up the whole night and we put all the equipment into our trucks. We had two trucks. And then I, I, I'm telling you that um, Matt Blackwell, who was with us, he had, he had brought a new camera that he had and he really wanted to just get a few shots of the stars before we left. And so we all kind of just hung out outside this observatory, enjoying like a nice peaceful a uh, few minutes while Matt took a few photos and I, and I, I he saved us because of that <laughs> um, because we just spent that extra like 10 minutes hanging out, you know? And so then we got in the trucks <clears throat> and we began heading down the mountain road to head back to the other, uh, where we were staying. And it, just a few minutes into it, I was driving in the car with Carlos, who was a, a, a someone we had hired down in Chile. who was a, awesome. He was amazing. He was a kind of a, production assistant uh, guy who could do everything. So Carlos and I were driving in the second truck behind Mike, Ryan, and Matt. And we were actually listening to uh, some rock and roll music, very loud. Um, and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, as we're driving down the road, we see that we're, we're, in, we're in the midst of a cloud of, of dust. And, and it was common when you, people were driving down these roads, the trucks would kick up a lot of dust. So we, that's what we figured it was. The, the, we figured that the first truck was just flying down the road and kicking up a lot of dust. But it was a little strange. It, it, so we started going slowly, and the dust uh, began to clear a little bit. And then we could see that the truck, the second truck in front of us was stopped. And they were out of the truck, and they were kind of walking around, and we weren't quite sure what was going on. And then Matt came running up to our truck and he said, an earthquake just happened. And now the rock, the whole road is covered in rocks. And so what, what happened was when the earthquake hit, we were still up at the peak. And that's why I was thankful that Matt had taken those photos because we were, uh, we were out of range of falling rocks at that point when it actually hit. But then we had to get down this 45 minute of winding mountain road that was now just covered in these huge rocks. And so we would we tried to kind of slowly steer between them and, and we had to get out, I don't know, four or five times it seems to just clear off these huge boulders off the road. And meanwhile, we're, we're so you can see in this photo that Mike has up, this is the only photo that we got, even though we had two truckloads full of camera equipment. And it's partially because I think we were all so nervous as we're pushing these rocks off the road and there's these huge cliffs towering above us that there was gonna be a second aftershock or something and we just wanted to get the heck off the right road so um yeah, yeah so the the whole way home it, it was just rocks everywhere and, and some of them were huge boulders it was it was crazy yeah and we ended up i think we ran into the uh not literally ran into but met up with um the security team from the other from the other mountain from Cerro Gelolo making their way over and they're like you just you just came down the mountain. Like, are, you, are you insane? Yeah, so, yeah. And then after that, like more aftershocks. I felt more earthquakes in the like week or two after that than I've felt during my entire like twelve years in California. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like there was one every every day or every other day, and they were pretty big too. Yeah, and yeah. we even so Matt Matt had set up two different cameras at Gemini to shoot night time lapse. And so he actually, actually, and he had another one at Cerro Pachon. So we actually got some really interesting footage first of them, you know, turning on the lights in Gemini because the, the crew that was working in there turned on the lights to check that none of the equipment had been damaged. And then they just shut everything down for several days. And then at the other time lapse he did, it was out looking out at the valley. And you could see when the earthquake hit, all this dust in the valley just poof went up in the yeah. air. Really cool in time lapse. This so is the well. valley right here. This really cool town called Vicuña is where we stayed part of the time. And we stayed in this um, incredible vineyard where they have a planetarium. Let's see if I can find it. Called Alpha Aldea. Yeah. Uh, that place is amazing. Yeah. Here's a picture of uh, the planetarium in the background. Me with uh, Albert Einstein. Yeah. And, and they would do. We did have one proprietor of the uh, place. 
Oh, so the, the question was, uh, was, is there a shot we would go back and get, or which shot would we go back and get if we had the chance? It's a good question. Um, I would say I would love to go to the Vera Rubin telescope. It's it used to be called LSST. And when we were there, um, it was still under construction. I think it still is under construction. And um, we weren't able to go there, partly because of the schedule, partly because of that earthquake, which sort of threw off our entire schedule. Um, but it's right next to Gemini South. And uh, it's an incredible, let me see if I can find it, incredible looking telescope. Um, yeah, we ended up, oh, go ahead, Ken. The funny thing with that, um, not getting that shot is that because we didn't get that shot, we ended up having to build that whole scene. Uh, Mike actually built the, the whole scene in uh, computer in the computer. So there's a shot in the film that's actually a really cool time lapse of the telescope being built, and that's all CG that Mike did. So, Here we go. and that was partly because we couldn't actually get there to shoot it. <laughs> If I can find it here. Oh, that, that's it, it in the distance. Yeah. Sunset this, behind it. That shot right there is from one of our last nights. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's a great one. This was one of the last shoot nights that we did. And we were actually shooting uh, Gemini, which is right behind us. But we we also looked over and we had this beautiful view of, of the Vera Rubin telescope with the sun setting behind it. And so... This that moment that we had, which is really wonderful, ended up inspiring Mike to do the the animation that's actually in the show. You you see the sun set behind the telescope, so that was yeah. based off of reality. And again, the the scale of this is just it's hard to fathom. Like the the building that's off to the left there is I think four stories tall, and the the top of the or the base of the dome is I think seven stories high, and then the dome itself is just incredibly. Uh, huge. So it's a it's an amazing uh, project that we'll be seeing first light in the next couple of years. I will say that I think one of the shots that it, I, I guess what I would, would have wanted was just one more day up at Alma because <laughs> we yeah. had, uh, I, so uh, at, at Alma, which is in uh, which is farther north from this um, location that we've been talking about of Sierra Tololo and Sierra Pachon. Uh, Alma is up in the Atacama desert and it um, it's one of the driest places on earth and for all the reasons that Josh described it's a great place to do astronomy and yet when we arrived for our tightly packed three days of uh, going up and and being able to shoot uh, video at this at, at 16,000 feet the, at this um, amazing uh, collection of, of, of submillimeter and radio telescopes um, they had a snowstorm, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So it was just kind of amazing that uh, that it timed out that way, and so we managed to to do a lot in our last day, uh, but uh, uh, and, and captured some really amazing footage. But it would have been nice to have a little bit more, a little more time up there. Yeah, yeah. It was quite an ordeal going up there. On your way up, you had to first stop at the the. Um, maintenance site which is at about ten thousand feet above sea level i think and, and acclimatize for about an hour or two get your blood pressure taken uh, make sure you're healthy enough to go up to sixteen thousand five hundred feet and then you get to go up there only if the weather's good um and, and then uh, you can only stay up a maximum of two hours so yeah it's got a lot of work done pretty uh pretty efficiently but it, the, it's so clear up there, like Josh said earlier. It's amazing. Here's uh, Matt setting up one of the time-lapse cameras. He set up three of them, and they would just leave them overnight, and then the guard would bring them down in the morning, and we'd meet them at the guard station below and pick it up and then basically develop the film <laughs> and to see what happened. And the first time he left them up there, it snowed, and we have this great shot of the snowstorm coming in, time-lapse, and, and eventually just covering up the lens and then no shot. So we weren't able to use that in the show, but it's still cool to look at. We well, hope to, oh, oh, go ahead, Ryan. No, go ahead. I was just going to say in this photo, there's a cherry picker over there. And what they were doing is they were removing ice from the, the radio antennas while we were up there. And we were hoping we could go up in there and shoot, but we weren't able to because of the snow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're coming up on time. I don't know if there were any other final thoughts uh, before um, I was just going to talk a, 
conclude with a little bit of a astronomy visualization that's also in the show. But is there anything else? I well, I just wanted to say one of the joys of shooting time lapse photography is that you put your camera out. Sometimes you leave it out there and you go to sleep, maybe, and you hope <laughs> that it's going to be there in the morning. And then you have this excitement of looking at the footage to see what you got. And sometimes it's a snowstorm or uh, one of the time lapses that I shot down there, a fox actually came up and, and like sniffed the lens and covered the lens in fox snot. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really fun to shoot time lapse. I recommend it. Yeah, very zen. Yeah. And Matt Blackwell got really good at it and has some beautiful shots in the show. So I hope you can come see it. Yeah. At, from your house, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> we hope you can come see it when the Academy opens. Yes. Soon. Eventually, we will be showing it in Morrison Planetarium, but uh, as I said, a little premiere uh, in 360 video online on, on September 26th. Well, thank you, uh, Ken and Mike. Uh, and um, uh, we'll keep our eyes on any questions. We can bring Ken, Mike, or Josh back uh, for any Q&A at the end of this. Uh, but to wrap up, I just wanted to show one of the things that we've done a lot of in the past, which is astronomy visualization. And so we have a clip that shows a, a specific location uh, that's recreated in computer graphics. Uh, it's a place called Beta Pictoris. And you know, this is a kind of a, a visualization, the type of visualization that's been done uh, for a lot of planetarium shows, showing a disk of material around a star. Uh, in this case, is one of the earliest what we'd call protoplanetary disks ever discovered. And um, what's really interesting about this is it's a little, it's astrophysically uh, a bit different from the other kinds of simulations like this we've shown. So we're highlighting here the locations of, of objects that are kind of like Kuiper Belt objects in our own, own solar system, icy bodies, small icy bodies that are out at the edge of the system. And that's really what this, this is made up of. And what's interesting about this disk is it's what we call optically thin. So we're actually making it kind of artificially bright as seen from above. In fact, it would be so transparent that you really wouldn't even see the disk if you were looking at it face on. But this disk has been driven by this uh, orbit you're seeing there of a planet toward the interior. And we actually observe this disk edge on from Earth. And you can see there's a little warp in the disk uh, and the disk gets brighter uh, when you see it edge on. So as far as we know, no other planetarium show has visualized this type of uh, astrophysical disk. So it's just kind of an interesting challenge for us. And it kind of rounds out that story of astronomy in Chile. So the story of the astronomy is about the people who work at these amazing observatories. And in the show, you'll hear directly uh, from, uh, from uh, about eight people who uh, live and work in Chile at these observatories. And then also see these amazing places, uh, the, the observatories themselves and the phenomenal landscape of Chile. And then finally wrap it up with, uh, with an astronomy story, uh, the observations that help us understand how planets take shape around other stars. So that's the story of big astronomy. Again, we're putting in our, our chat and comments uh, where you can go to find uh, opportunities to observe, to watch the show. Uh, the big day to remember is September 26th on Saturday and at noon Pacific time, uh, you'll be able to participate in a 360 live stream. So again, if you have your, uh, your phone or tablet or a headset, or even on your desktop computer, uh, you can watch it uh, live stream on YouTube at noon Pacific. And actually we'll be doing kind of like you saw here, but with a little bit more uh, immersive bent to it and with a, a larger cast of characters, we'll talk a little bit more about how we made the show after you get a chance to see it uh, in 360 on September 26. We have other showings. If you go to bigastronomy.org, you can find out when those are on September 26. And then we're looking at how we will include this in our regular schedule of, uh, of streaming on the California Academy of Sciences YouTube page. So I'm gonna look down here to see if there are any other questions. It doesn't look like there are. So again, thank you, uh, Josh Roberts for the introduction to astronomy in Chile. Uh, thank you, Ken Ackerman and Mike Schmidt uh, for the behind the scenes of big astronomy. Uh, and thank you, Mary Holt, who's been behind the scenes of this broadcast, producing it uh, to make sure it all runs smoothly. So we'll hope to see you next week for Cosmic Conversations at 11.30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and thanks for joining us today.